Hi everyone, it's me, Tim. Today I wanna to talk about Arcanum's generated dialogue system. And I know I've been talking about Arcanum a lot, but I mean, I've got the code right in front of me. I've been going through it a lot. I've been playing with it. And the generated dialogue system is something I'm particularly proud of because it let the few designers that were on Arcanum, and we had even, of the fewer designers, we had even fewer narrative designers. And it let those few people, I mean, think about it. We only had 14 people tops on Arcanum and just a few writing dialogue. They let them make so much content in the game, which, so it was a good tool. But in particular, I liked it because it really doubled down on Arcanum's reactivity. And I'll talk about why um, when I get to the NPC one. But this could be really long. I'm probably talking really fast, but there's just so much to talk about. And it's it's a detailed topic for me. Anyway, our generated, generated dialogue system in Arcanum consisted of a number of opcodes. Um, I called them dialogue opcodes. The way they worked was in the place of what you would write, where what, what an NPC would say or a player would say, you could write an opcode. And it was just a single letter, like A colon or B colon. It always was followed by colon. After the colon, nothing might be there. But frequently, there were a lot of parameters that were optional for each opcode. Opcodes could handle lots of different things. And I let the designers decide to turn on and off certain checks that it made or to provide parameters for things that the opcode was going to control. And I'll talk about that. What's important to remember, though, is the opcode didn't turn into a single line of dialogue. These opcodes expanded in, in, into an entire subtree. And I'll explain that in just a minute. What was nice about opcodes is they handled all the gendered combinations, you know, a man talking to a man, female to female, male to female, female to male, male, which matters in most languages. But I just remember things like, you know, French, if you'd say, you know, you are pretty, it would be different depending on the gender of the person you're calling pretty. Um, I know we also had NPC social class. So that could factor into how some lines may get may have gotten translated into Japanese, which takes social standing into account in how they write things. The speaking of which, the NPCs in Arcanum had one of eleven social classes applied to them. They could only have one, and they were in order of top to bottom. They were noble, priest, wizard, technologist, shopkeeper, guard. City dweller, villager, beggar, thief, and bandit. So yes, a city dweller was more up the social standing than a villager, and a wizard was above a technologist. Although that there was questioning whether that was going to be switching soon. Um, in addition to that, opcodes could reference skills and spells, attributes. You these were basically part of the parameter list you could pass into it. Okay, after that long introduction, let's jump into what they were. Um, the NPC, NPCs only had two opcodes that were unique to NPCs. And the first one was greeting, which I'm going to talk about last because it is by far the most complicated opcode. But the second one was money. If you added this line to an NPC, they would ask for money and they would do it based on their social class. So a, a noble person would ask for money very differently, you know, like, sir, I must ask, you know, coinage to exchange hands. I'm not a dialogue writer. Where a beggar would be like, can you spare a couple coins? You, The parameters were how much money you would ask for. If you didn't put it in, I think it defaulted to 10 coins. But you could put in how much money you're asking for. And this is a perfect example of how it expanded into an entire tree. The, the M, if you wrote M colon 100, that would expand into the NPC saying, you know, excuse me, sir, but... Could you spare a hundred coins or whatever they're going to say based on the social class? A shopkeeper would be, you know, you I need a hundred coins for that. Then the PC could respond yes or no. And if they said yes, the NPC would respond 
either, okay, I've t- they've taken the money and it would get subtracted, or you don't have enough money. If you'd say no, it would bow out. And then it would go, in all, after those cases, after getting the money, it would go to the line that that dialogue line said to go to. The PC, on the other hand, had a zillion opcodes. I'm not going to go into detail on all of them. Let me just run down them really quick. I think they were alphabetized in code, which is really easy to go through. There was appreciate. It was basically the PC saying thank you. And you may wonder why we had opcodes for things as simple as that. And that's variety. You could write a colon and be done. And you know that might be thank you, thanks, I appreciate it. That's nice of you or whatever. And it was by class. So that would adjust. There was barter, bartering. Uh, there was check story state. That was an interesting one. If the PC put in a check story state opcode, it would insert a line where the player would ask about something relevant to the current story state of the game. Remember I told you Arcanum had 27 story states it went through as compared to Fallout's only three. So we broke the main story into 27 distinct story states. Each one of those had a set of generic things that the PC could ask about that story state to NPCs. There was asking for directions to a location. So the op, this was an example of an opcode that required a parameter. Uh, if you asked for it, it would the NPC would tell you how to get there, but would not mark your map. There was a separate one called X for X marks the spot, which was exactly like directions, but also put a mark on your map. We added that because there were narrative designers who wanted both. I should have made it a parameter, but it already had the parameter for a location, and I tried to avoid extra parameters. We had exit dialogue, which would them saying goodbye, I have to go, see ya. Uh, there was forget it, never mind, because that was a frequently used thing in PC responses. Never mind, I, I don't care anymore. Forget this, forget I asked, whatever. There was asking for healing. Uh, there was uh, asking more questions. There was the generic line of like, I have more questions I want to ask you, because that was a common one as well. There was a load of world map where the player would say something Appropriate, like, I'm going to go look up my map now, and then would just jump the player right to load the world map for fast travel purposes from a dialogue. Um, there was buying a paper. There was the... Uh, oh, there was an M1. What is that? I think that's money as well. Um, there was a quest one, which I'll explain more in a second. There was saying, I'm sorry, in various ways. There was asking for training, and you could specify what skill you were looking for training in. And that that was put, it was the narrative designer's responsibility. If the player asks for training, the NPC off could look up what training they asked for. They would look up their skill and go, okay, if you ask for training in this skill, oh, I'm a master in this skill, I will offer master training. There was also use skill. You could ask the NPC to use a skill for you. And this is in addition to like healing or training or anything like that. There's X marks the spot. There was yes, which were a million ways of saying yes. Um, there was no, a million ways of saying no. Uh, and there was also zap, which was you specified a particular spell and it's asking that player to cast that spell. So you, if you wanted a priest to cast resurrect or uh, speak for dead or something, you could say zap, Z colon and the spell number and it would do that. Now, both NPCs and PCs had two um, opcodes that they shared. One was insult. As a PC line, it insulted the NPC based on their class. So you would say something like, you're the worst noble person I've ever met, or you're a stuck-up city dweller. For the NPC lines, it, in, it insulted the NPC based on their race. So the NPC, based on their own social class, would say something to the player based on whether they're a human, half-orc, dark elf, elf, halfling. So we had this huge bank that we had fun making insults. Like, what would a shopkeeper say to a dark elf they were angry at? Or what would a beggar say to a half-orc? And so we had tons of funds making those banks. And remember, every time these things pulled from a bank, so even if they just created one line... There were dozens, in some cases, multiple dozens of these lines that it could use. And then finally, there was an, a rumor one that could be used for PC and NPC. As a PC, it was it would expand to a line basically saying, hey, have you heard any cool rumors? 
for NPCs, it would be offering rumors. And again, for the parameters, it could be a single number or a set of numbers or a range of numbers. And those were all the rumors that that NPC could offer. It would go look and any NP any rumor that they already knew, um, you could, the person using the opcode say, if, hey, if they've already heard the rumor, don't do it. But they could override that and say, nope, if, I don't care if, if they pay for a rumor and get something they've already heard. Rumors were based on story state, where you are in the game, um, and social class. So the NPCs would, a beggar would tell you a slightly different thing about, there's bandits down by the river, where a noble person would go, I understand there are bandits that have set up camp and are disrupting trade. So again, we had lots of banks for each individual rumor had banks of things that could be said. Optionally, there was an optional parameter, and I tried to avoid too many parameters like this, but rumor just took a ton, that you could add how much money um, that it would cost you to get the rumor. And by the way, internally, that was handled by this rumor opcode inserting an ask for money opcode dynamically in the middle of it. So I mean, the rumor opcode expanded it into an entire multi-branch dialogue tree. So this is how we saved money and got variety at the same time. Now, I said I was going to talk about how quests and greeting work because they were complicated. Quests were really complex. Quests had seven states, unknown, mentioned, accepted, achieved, completed, completed by a different NPC, a different PC for multiplayer, and botched. Um, unknown was if you'd never heard it. Mentioned was you heard it, but you didn't accept it. Accept it was when you accepted it. Achieved is when you had done the things you were supposed to do, but you hadn't turned it in yet. And then completed was you turned it in. Botched was a flag that if it was set on anything that wasn't completed, changed the state to botched. But if you took the flag off, it went back to whatever state it was at. And that was because it was possible for the player to be, maybe you said you'd rescue some kidnapped person and you got them. So now the quest was in the achieved state, but it's not completed. And on the way back, they get killed. If you raise them, the killing when they die, their script says botch the quest. But if you raise them, that their script would say, okay, I'm back alive, unbotch the quest. So it would go back to achieved. So if you had just accepted the quest and on the way to get them, they died, it would get botched and it would go in your it would look as failed in your quest log. But if you arrived and healed them or resurrected them, it would go back to accepted. So Botched was done as a flag so that you could go in and out of being a botched state. Now, you can't botch a completed quest because it's already completed. So if you get the villager back home, you get the ransom money for uh, or the money for rescuing them from the kidnappers, and then you leave it, and then he dies, it's not going to botch your quest because you've already finished that quest. Once the quest is completed, the state is permanent. Um, the way this worked was you would say Q colon and the quest number, and it would... If it was a PC line, it would generate a line where the player asks if there are any quests available and the NPC would answer about that quest number. If it was an NPC line, the NPC would dive right into something related to the current state. So if it was kidnapping somebody, if somebody was kidnapped, if it was unknown, they'd go, hey, someone's been kidnapped. My, you know, my, my husband's been kidnapped. I'll give you 100 coins to go find them. I think the bandits have them. If it was mentioned, the same woman might go, hey... I told you about my husband being, being kidnapped. Are you ever going to go look for him? If it was accepted, she'd say, hey, why aren't you out looking for my husband? You said you promised to do that. If it was achieved, she'd be like, oh, you found my husband and set it to completed. And then if it was completed, she either might say nothing um, or she might go, you know, I always thank you very much for rescuing my husband. So... I love, and if it was failed, you'd be like, oh my God, I heard my husband's dead. So you can tell how that would expand. These are interesting is these, these dialogue lines, these banks were written specifically for that quest by the narrator designer. So they weren't pulled from a generic pool of lines, like say, ask for money or, you know, forget about it or exit were. Greeting though, was the most complicated opcode we'd ever made. It was for NPCs. The reason it was so complicated was it covered everything. This is where Arcanum generated a lot of its reactivity from. Because the way an NPC opened a dialogue with you is something you usually remember. And it would create greetings. It would create greetings on a huge number of tests. And these tests 
for the greeting could be skipped or overridden. Um, if you skipped it, you in Gen General we did all the tests, and I will go over the order. Did it in? Did it in? The narrative designer could always say skip this test. So do test zero and one, but don't do test zero, uh, two and three, and then do the rest. You can also say override it by saying test for that one, but if it's true, don't use a generic bank greeting. I have my own override for it that I want you to say. So let me go through what all the tests were. And keep in mind, these were also by um, NPC social class. So I'll go through them in order from test zero, because I'm a C programmer, um, up to uh, test uh, 11, 10 or 11. Okay. So test zero was, it literally checks to see if the NPC is dead. If they are, then it, then because you can't talk to a dead person unless you're using speak with dead, you must be using speak with dead. So nine times out of 10, or 99 times out of 100, the narrative designer will override this. But if he doesn't override it, it would say something like, I'm dead and I know nothing. Why are you, why did you rip me into pain, the pain of the living? Because remember all the Arcanum uh, dead NPCs are in agony when you bring them back to life. Uh, test one, it would check for associates among the player character. Uh, this is why it was important to only have one player character because it would go to that player character and say, who are his associates? It would check for summoned monsters, for animated dead, and for illusions. Those were three separate checks with their own banks that it could respond to. If the NPC was a wizard, he would make a sarcastic comment about your associate like, uh, you know, I learned how to summon Fire Elemental when I was 15. Or, really, your zombies are tracking mud in here? And it would continue. For everyone else, they would make a comment about how afraid they were and to exit the dialogue. Which means you would have to um, get rid of the, uh, the that associate before you could talk to them. Keep in mind, narrative designers could override that and say, do a, do a fear comment and then go into dialogue. So it was, you could have it both ways as a narrative designer. Um, then it would test for spells that were operating on the player. It would test in this order. Um, it would test invisibility, body of air, body of stone, body of fire, body of water, polymorph, mirror image, and shrink. Now, it would test in that order, and each one of those spells had its own bank of comments. Again, if the NPC was a wizard, he'd make a sarcastic comment like, could you please turn the invisibility off? Fine, I'll deal with you invisibly. Or, um, you know, I forget what Polymorph turned you into. It's like, really, you want me to deal with you as a sheep? Fine. But the wizard ones always continued. Otherwise, this is what would happen for all non-wizard NPCs. If you had one of the body spells on, it would do a particular body comment and exit. If you were polymorphed into a sheep, it would comment on that and exit. If you had shrunk yourself, they would make a comment of how adorably small you were, but continue. If it was mirror image, they would make a comment about how many of them, which one of you is talking to me? You know, are you twins? And continue. If it was invisibility, they'd make a fearful comment like, who said that? Was that a ghost? And exit. So again... You had to add narrative designer. You had to override it if that's not the behavior you wanted. Then it would do two different tests on your armor. If you were completely naked, so just in your underwear, because we were a Victorian game, the NPC would respond by their class and continue. So they'd be like, oh my, you know, you're down to your skivvies or something like that. If you were wearing this armor that was marked as barbarian armor and there was a flag we could put on any armor, again, they would respond by class. And continue. So, you know, a person might go, how uncouth, you know, where a shopkeeper were like, oh, we normally don't serve your kind and continue. Otherwise, we got to, we're up to like test nine or 10 here. You would get greet, greeted by the NPC based on their reaction to you. If it was a first meeting, then that was broken into a great greeting. All these were, um, by class, if they loved you, then you get a great greeting by class. Friendly, a good greeting by the NPC's class. Courteous, 
an, again, a good greeting by NBC class. Neutral, a neutral greeting by the NBC's class. Suspicious, a bad greeting by the PC race. Dislikes, another bad greeting by the PC race. Animosity, a worst greeting based on the PC's race. But if you met before, we had a different set of banks. So they could say, you know, nice to see you again. Or, oh, what are you doing here again? And again, it was broken down into love, friendly, courteous, neutral in the same groups by class, by the embassy's class, or suspicious, just like animosity by the PC's race. This let us do so much. You had a spell key that was still running that made a visual effect. They're probably going to comment on it. You wear certain kinds of armor or you're not wearing armor at all. They're going to comment on it. You have, you know, they, they like you or don't like you. They're going to comment on it. They, you've been there before. You're, they're going to get a different comment. And I, what I loved about that was shopkeepers were often like, oh, is this your first time in the store? Would you like to see the inventory? Versus, oh, it's nice to see you back. That's if they liked you. If they didn't like you, it's like, oh, it's my big spender. What do you, you know, uh, what do you want to see this time? Notice you may or may not have been a big spender. They're making fun of you because they don't like you. Um, and of course, they'd often do it by race. So it's like, oh, it, look, look, it's the the half fork that thinks that it's it's a person. Or, you know, I wonder where you got your money from. So it was just a great way of constantly reminding you of the choices you made. I loved this. This, that that's all the op codes, by the way. That system is what let us put together such a rich dialogue uh, set in Arcanum because even if all the rest of it was handcrafted, that greeting allowed so much reactivity on so many different axes and people noticed. And it was a really good way of kind of, it kind of helped people in their minds. Arcanum was just something extra special in that regard. Never done this since. Um, when I tried to introduce this in later games, especially at other companies, nobody was interested. I'm hoping now that AI has advanced in these LLMs, these large language model AIs, that something like this could be done, but with a lot more variety, um, especially now that AIs can also do speech synthesis. So again, I am hope this is like a primitive 20-year-old generated dialogue system. We could do a lot better today, but I thought you guys would like to hear exactly how it worked in Arcanum.